Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Baby, I'm home. Oh, it smells in here. Did you leave something on the stove again? You gotta stop doing that. My family missed you. I wish you would have come with me. Hello? What have you been getting up to while I was gone? I've been trying to get in touch with you for days. Actually, don't tell me. You know what upsets me when I hear about your antics. Baby, where are you? He must be down at that damn tavern. You've been drinking too much lately, Sonny. You're a boxer. You've got to keep up that physique if you're going to win any fights. (gasps) Oh, my God. On January 5th, 1971, Geraldine Liston returned to her home in Las Vegas. Her relationship with her husband had never been perfect, but his drive and motivation had been infectious, which is why, even after she had not heard from him for several days, she never expected to find 39-year-old Sonny Liston, the former heavyweight champion of the world, dead at the foot of their bed. This is our first episode on Sonny Liston, the notorious heavyweight boxer who died mysteriously in his Las Vegas home in 1970. This week, we'll examine the events leading up to his suspicious death. Next week, we'll uncover who may have been responsible for it. Charles Sonny Liston was born sometime between 1929 and 1932. He believed his birthday was May 8, 1932, but he was never sure. His mother, Helen Baskin, was able to give him several possibilities for the day he was born, but could never nail down an exact date. At times, she was even shaky on the year as well. Sonny wasn't given an easy start in life. He was the second youngest of his mother's 12 children and the 24th of 25 kids for his dad, Toby Liston, who had children from a previous marriage. The family lived in a small shack outside of Forest City, Arkansas. And with such a large family and few resources, Sonny was often cold and hungry. The hardships the Listons faced were only made worse by the fact that they were African-American, which meant that they faced segregation, prejudice, and institutionalized racism. From the time he was young, Sonny's father required that Sonny do his part by working on the family share crop. But with most of his time spent doing physical labor, there was little to no time left for school. In his childhood, he never learned to read or write. Sonny's father was abusive, both physically and emotionally. He often beat Sonny and other members of the family. Many people throughout Sonny's life would comment on the scars on his back, left by his father's beatings. By 1943, Sonny's mother had had enough and left for St. Louis to find factory work, leaving Sonny behind with his father. The boy was devastated. He felt completely abandoned, and he felt very little loyalty to his father. So the following year, in 1944, he left home to track down his mother in St. Louis. It wasn't easy finding his mother, but nothing in his life thus far had been easy. He searched high and low, eventually reuniting with her after several nights sleeping at a police station. When he was with his mother again, Sonny attempted to go to school for the first time, but he was ruthlessly teased for his illiteracy and soon dropped out. He attempted to find work, but could only find sporadic or temporary gigs. Used to physical labor, he was strong and capable but he nevertheless struggled to land on his feet. As a black man in the South, finding steady work would be an uphill battle. Perhaps out of necessity, or maybe because he'd been hardened by the difficulties of his young life, Sonny soon turned to something more lucrative and a bit more reliable than hard labor, crime. All right, lady, hand over the bag and no one gets hurt. Uh, Oh, I, oh God. My purse! By 1950, 
Sonny had been charged with numerous muggings and had robbed gas stations and diners. When he was finally caught red-handed during a robbery at Unique Cafe on Market Street, he was sentenced to five years behind bars in the Missouri State Penitentiary. Sonny's prison papers reflect that he gave his age at the time as 20, though there was always a question as to whether that was accurate. By the time of his incarceration, Sonny had already seen a lot of hardship in his short life. But compared to what he had left behind, he found prison to be relatively straightforward. It was the first time he could rely on three regular meals a day. But more importantly, it gave Sonny the opportunity to start boxing. He quickly showed an extreme aptitude for the sport, beating any and all inmates that challenged him. In fact, there was a running joke that Sonny would have to be matched against two or three people for anyone to have a fighting chance. The chaplains at the prison, Reverend Edward Schlatman and then Father Alois Stevens, took notice of Sonny, at first for his boxing prowess, and then for the person they saw behind the gloves, a genuine and dedicated human being, one whose talents could take him places. Father Stevens advocated heavily for Sonny and was able to get him out on parole after serving only two years of his sentence. Sonny walked away a free man on October 31, 1952. Father Stevens wanted to give Sonny a better life and a way to provide for himself, so he connected Sonny with a new family, a set of fight managers, including John Vitale, a notorious mobster who could hopefully get the kid's boxing career off the ground. They started Sonny fighting in the amateur boxing circuit, pinning him against local boxers. Sonny's only job was to win, which he did most of the time. He wasn't making much money yet, but that was okay. His fight managers had another way Sonny could repay them. All right, kid. You like money? Yes, sir. You like soft furs, gin martinis, riding around in nice cars? <laughs> well, yes, sir, I do. We'll take care of that. All you got to do is keep boxing. But listen, sometimes we ask a little favor. You would do a little something for us. That sound good? I think so. What kind of favor? John Vitale and the other managers wanted to use him for another purpose besides boxing. Intimidation. When the mob needed to collect money or break some kneecaps, they sent Sonny Liston. And with his towering figure and impressive physique, he was quite effective. But this new gig didn't slow down his success in the amateur boxing circuit. Most notably, Sonny won the 1953 Chicago Golden Gloves Tournament and beat 1952 Olympic heavyweight champion Ed Sanders. That same year, he competed in the United States National Championships in Boston and in the International Golden Gloves Tournament in St. Louis. His coach, Tony Anderson, said that Sonny was the strongest fighter he had ever seen. To Sonny, the best fighter this side of the Mississippi. Nah, he'd match gloves with any chap on both sides of the river. Salute. Now, Sonny, we were thinking, with all this winning you've been doing, it's about time you swing those mitts with the pros. <laughs> that sounds great, sir, but I know I don't have the money for it. <laughs> Listen to this guy talking about money. You just leave that to us. You know we have connections. All you gotta do is just keep on being a star. Now, can we get another round over here, barkeep? In September 1953, Sonny Liston went pro with financial backing from the mob. If his fight managers had felt at all like they were taking a risk on Sonny, their gamble paid off. Sonny won seven consecutive fights over the next year. The newly minted star was now bringing in real money, and for the first time in his life, he was able to not have the constant worry of money buzzing in the background. For the first time, too, he was known for something other than being a neighborhood menace. He was becoming famous as a boxer. Still, he may have been revered as an athlete, but he wasn't necessarily seen by the white public in a favorable light. They saw him as a violent caricature, a racial stereotype. The press often referred to him as a beast. 
The fame made sure that Sonny did less dirty work for the mob, but he continued to get into trouble with the police. Perhaps it was his abusive upbringing, or maybe it was simply the only life he knew. Or perhaps it was that any time Sonny ventured out of a quote-unquote black area, he was routinely stopped by the police. He was understandably frustrated by this treatment and wasn't above letting the police know it. It became a self-fueling cycle where racist cops stopped Sonny because he was black, which led to Sonny's angry and violent outbursts, which led to more stops by the police. A particularly volatile altercation with an officer occurred in 1956. Sonny was sitting in a cab with a friend when he was stopped by a policeman. Sonny claimed that the cop berated him with racial slurs. Sonny responded by grabbing the cop's gun and hitting him over the head with it. After lifting the cop in the air, he slammed him back down to the ground with such force that he broke the cop's knee. There's no denying Sonny's treatment of the cop was violent. But the incident was described sensationally in the papers in a way that was much more sympathetic to a white point of view. The white public read an account of Sonny being repeatedly hit over the head with a billy stick and being completely unfazed by it. This cemented the idea in the public's minds that Sonny was a dangerous monster, a beast who could not be stopped. As a result, the boxer was sentenced to nine months in a St. Louis workhouse for the incident. But soon after he was paroled early, he was stopped by a cop again. This cop ended up stuffed into a trash can, and Sonny was given an ultimatum. He could either leave St. Louis, or the police would see to it that he died there. They were going to keep stopping him every time they saw him on the street. The cycle would continue until Sonny was dead. Sonny's fight managers immediately sold his contract to a new set of managers in Philadelphia. For the first time since he ventured into town as a young boy looking for his mother, Sonny would be leaving St. Louis. But he wasn't moving to the straight and narrow. His new managers had deep connections to organized crime, including the infamous Frankie Carbo, a Murder, Inc. gunman turned boxing promoter. But it wasn't all boxing. Sonny was enjoying having money to spend and a set of well-connected friends to enjoy spending it with. It was while he was living in Philly that Sonny met and married his wife, Geraldine Chambers. Sonny loved Geraldine, but he was also enjoying his status as a famous boxer, taking advantage of the access it granted him with women. Geraldine knew that she never had 100% of her husband's attention in their marriage, but she also felt that it didn't matter as long as Sonny loved her when he was with her. She was always a fiercely loyal and devoted wife to Sonny. There you are. Ugh, I must have dozed off while I was waiting for you. W what time is it? Late. Where were you? Just out with Frankie and the boys. I see. Well, come to bed. I know you love me, Sonny. You just have a funny way of showing it. You're too good to me, Geraldine. Sonny's unfaithfulness had some unintended consequences, and it is believed that he may have fathered several children with other women. Legend has it that Geraldine and Sonny were sitting in a diner when a waitress presented the couple with a child who was Sonny's son. <laughs> so then I said to Tony, <clears throat> Oh, Susie, it, good to see you. I didn't know you'd had a baby. He's a very handsome little fellow. Yeah? Well, this handsome little fellow is half Sonny. And we were wondering what his worst half was going to do about it. Sonny and Geraldine adopted the little boy and raised him. His name was Daniel, and Geraldine never thought of him any differently than if he were her own son. All the while, Sonny continued making strides in the boxing ring. His impressive size and incredibly large hands were a force to be reckoned with, he won match after match until he was the number one contender for the heavyweight champion of the world. The only problem was public perception of Sonny still wasn't great. Large swaths of the country were overtly racist, and the press often referred to him in extremely offensive terms. Well, not to mention that Liston's connections to organized crime were not exactly a secret. These connections made Sonny a despised figure, despite his success. 
He was booed frequently when he won matches, and other boxers were not too keen on fighting this controversial figure. Most notably, the heavyweight champion of the world, Floyd Patterson. Patterson's team refused to accept Sonny's challenge until he switched to management, effectively ending his relationship with the mob. Sonny did so in May of 1961, tagging George Katz as his new manager. He hoped this would end the rumors of his connections to Frank Palermo and Frankie Carbo, opening the door for him to challenge for the title. Unfortunately, Sonny dug himself in a deeper hole, one that he had little chance to get out of. In late 1961, Sonny was accused of posing as a cop and harassing a woman in a public park. Well, Sonny denied the accusations, but it didn't matter. His boxing license was indefinitely suspended. Just as he was about to reach the pinnacle of his sporting career, it looked as though Sonny Liston would never box again. Coming up, we'll look at Sonny's reaction to losing his license and the events that led up to his mysterious death. And now back to the story. By the early 1960s, Sonny Liston was on the cusp of becoming the greatest boxer in the world. His large frame, powerful hands, and vicious left hook were obliterating opponent after opponent in the ring. Only one fighter stood in his way, Floyd Patterson. But after his latest run-in with the police, Sonny's boxing license was suspended. He was legally no longer allowed to fight. He was devastated. With nothing left for him in Philadelphia, Sonny spent time in Denver, later relocating there. It was here that he connected with a Jesuit priest named Father Edward Patrick Murphy. Sonny, welcome. Hi, Father. Sonny, I believe that you are a good man. I don't think that you've done any of the things they say you have. Thank you. I appreciate that. There are bad people in this world. People who only see black and white and can't see beyond. Who let their own prejudice get in the way of rational thinking of compassion. I want to help you, Sonny. You're not a monster. You're a good man. Three months later, Father Edward helped Sonny get the charges dropped and his boxing license reinstated. It was the second time a religious man had given him a lifeline, and Sonny was grateful. And more importantly, Sonny Liston was back in business and back on the path to becoming the greatest heavyweight boxer in the world. In September of 1962, Sonny finally got his chance to fight Floyd Patterson. After nearly two years of anticipation, the fight brought two of the generation's greatest into one ring. But those that were expecting an epic and long match were greatly disappointed. Sonny Liston knocked the heavyweight champion out in just over two minutes flat. He was now the world's greatest boxer. But even this did little to help his reputation. He received little to no fanfare when he returned to Philadelphia and was booed when he knocked Patterson out again in 1963. But he was still the champ, and he remained the champ until a young up-and-comer, a 22-year-old named Cassius Clay, defeated him in February of 1964. But it was Sonny's second fight with Muhammad Ali that went down as one of the most controversial moments in boxing history. Having lost to Ali once, Sonny was determined not to do it again. He trained aggressively and relentlessly for the rematch, which was scheduled for November 13th, 1964. Sonny pushed his body to its limits preparing for this fight and was understandably frustrated when the match had to be rescheduled due to emergency hernia surgery for Ali. He honestly wasn't sure he could take his body to that extreme a second time. Sonny may have been as old as 34 at this point, while Ali was a young man of 22. Rumors began to swirl at this time of alcohol and drug abuse on Sonny's part. We can't definitively confirm if this was true, but we do know that he was putting himself through a lot at this time, physically. The new date for Sonny's rematch with Ali was May 25th, 1965. A huge crowd came to see which of the two star boxers would emerge victorious. 
but the fight was much shorter than anyone could have anticipated. In the first round, Ollie threw a light punch that inexplicably knocked Sonny to the ground. From some angles, it didn't even look like the punch had connected with Sonny's body. But he went down and stayed there, all the same. People were shocked. Sonny, a massive, towering figure, had essentially been knocked over with a feather. Even Ali had trouble believing it. And the winner is Muhammad Ali. Sonny Liston is down for the count. One of the craziest damn things I've ever seen. Many people simply could not accept what had happened and thought that the only plausible explanation was that Sonny had thrown the fight. Theories circulated as to why Sonny may have done so. All he would say on the matter was that Ali had thrown a good punch that had injured his shoulder and taken him down. But years later, in an interview with Sports Illustrated, he had a different take on the situation. And... Can you tell me about the infamous rematch with Muhammad Ali in 65? Sure. Listen, man. That guy was crazy. I didn't want anything to do with him. And the Muslims were coming up. Who needed that? So I went down. I wasn't hit. So you fixed the match? I'm not saying yes, but I'm not saying no. Know what I'm saying? I... I think I do. The Muslims Sonny referenced in the article were the Nation of Islam. Just months before the rematch, members of the group had killed Malcolm X on February 21st, 1965. Muhammad Ali was affiliated with the Nation of Islam, and by some accounts, Sonny had been on the fence about doing the fight in the months before out of fear of being killed himself. Now, many people thought it was possible that Sonny had thrown the match at the group's urging, or more likely, at their threatening. There's another piece of the story that lends credibility to this theory. Before the match, Sonny had moved to Vegas to train, and it was here that he met and became pals with an infamous bookie named Ash Resnick. Well, many believe that Resnick brokered a deal with the Nation of Islam in which Sonny would receive a portion of all of Ali's future earnings in exchange for throwing the match. Sonny did receive medical attention for the shoulder injury that knocked him out, but it's easy to see how this offer might have been compelling. Whether losing the match was something Sonny chose or not, life was not the same after losing twice to Muhammad Ali. If he had been treated ruthlessly by the press and the public before, it was nothing compared to now. He was a laughing stock and a joke. Sonny moved his family permanently to Las Vegas and began spending less time boxing and more time with his new pal, Ash Resnick, according to the New York Post, who liked to think of himself as Sonny's personal concierge. <laughs> Sonny Liston, my man. Listen, whatever you need, I got you. You need women? I'll get you women. You need a party? I'll take you to the best party you ever seen. You need a little pick-me-up? I'm your guy. Pick-me-up? We talking drugs? Only the finest. Now we're talking. Resnick had an extremely sordid reputation, even by Vegas standards. Like many people in Sonny's life, he was closely tied to the mob, and he opened the door to more serious drug activity for Sonny. Sonny was no longer bringing in the cash he once did and immediately began to rack up gambling debts upon setting foot in Vegas. He needed a new source of income. With help from Resnick, Sonny began selling drugs and, according to some, using them as well. By the year 1970, Sonny was living a fast life in Vegas. He was partying every night, running a mid-level drug operation, and had a mistress on the side. He was still doing some lower-level fights, but had branched out into acting and music, playing roles in the films Harlow, Moonfire, and Head, which starred the Monkees. Additionally, he appeared in an episode of the TV show Love, American Style, and was in a commercial with Andy Warhol for Braniff Airlines. On Christmas Eve 1970, Sonny's wife Geraldine left Vegas to spend time with her family in St. Louis. She took their adopted son Daniel with her. Sonny stayed behind, 
saying that he wanted to enjoy the Strip at holiday time. Each year, Las Vegas turned into a quiet company town over Christmas before becoming an all-out hedonistic paradise over New Year's. On Christmas Day, 1970, Sonny met some friends at the town tavern, showing up with two white showgirls, one on each arm. His friend Clyde Watkins remembers noting that his friend Sonny was in high spirits. Hey, Sonny! Merry Christmas! You too, Clyde What are you doing later? Coming to your house to eat. <laughs> oh, please do. You know nothing would make me and my wife happier. According to one source, on Monday the 28th, Sonny had breakfast at a local haunt with a Las Vegas boxing ref named Davey Pearl. The two men went over plans for an upcoming fight of Sonny's. Afterwards, Sonny hopped in his car and drove to Hollywood. He was in L.A. by that evening when he checked into the Biltmore Hotel and had dinner with his talent agent. Sonny, I see big things for you. You're a household name. Now, let's bring you into their houses every night on the TV. I like the sound of that. Yeah? I'm going to need you to come out to L.A. more. Anything holding you back from that? Not a thing. Let's do it. According to the same source, phone records from Sonny's car phone show he made a few calls that day. Two were to Geraldine, and one was to Paramount Studios, where he had a meeting scheduled for the next day. On Tuesday, December 29th, Sonny Liston drove onto the Paramount lot and took a meeting with casting director Jim Merrick. In the days before the new year, Sonny was making a lot of plans for the future. After the meeting, he checked out of his hotel and headed back home to Vegas. According to an article printed in the Las Vegas Sun, one of the last people to see Sonny alive was a man named John Sleeper. Sonny had fared much better with the police in Las Vegas than he ever had in Denver, Philly, or St. Louis. And a large reason for that was that he allegedly had a man inside the Las Vegas Police Department looking out for him. Even when Sonny had been present during drug busts where everyone else went to jail, Sonny somehow walked away without a scratch or a charge pressed against him. It seems likely that the person who pulled strings for Sonny was John Sleeper. But by December 1970, Sleeper had fallen out of favor with the Las Vegas PD and was getting demoted, which was really just a prolonged firing. By early 1971, John Sleeper would be out of the force and managing a gas station. We can only assume that if John Sleeper stopped by Sonny Liston's house in the final days of 1970, it was to tell Sonny that he'd no longer be able to protect him from the police. Oh, come on, John. Don't be like that. I need you. I don't like dealing with unfriendly police. You know it's not my choice, Sonny. I don't have the freedom I used to have. They're watching me. I won't be able to protect you if there's another drug raid. I'm not trying to ruin your night. I wanted to warn you. (sighs) But I got a good thing going. Don't make me pull the plug. I'm not making you do anything. I'm just saying you need to know that I can't help you if they come for you. Be careful out there. John, Johnny, it's almost New Year's Eve. Let's let's have a drink and stop worrying and talking about being careful and all this stuff, okay? Hey, let's get our coats and go out. Let me buy you a drink. Least I can do for all you've done. But Sonny had a lot to worry about as the year came to a close. Physically, his body was not what it once was. He was now around 40 years old and had not been taking very good care of himself. He was having trouble whipping himself into shape like he used to, perhaps because he was a few years older than the birth year he had always claimed, or maybe because of alleged drug and alcohol use. Sonny had gambling debts, and he also had a wife and child to support, not to mention a mistress with an expensive drug habit. And his involvement with the mob and selling drugs had made him plenty of enemies. More than a few times, he'd escaped scot-free as friends of his had gone to jail for crimes that he had participated in. They weren't happy to see him walk free as they paid the price. But if Sonny had wanted to talk about his problems, it wasn't with Geraldine. She wasn't able to get a hold of him in the days leading up to New Year's Eve and began to grow worried. By January 5th, 1971, 
Sonny hadn't answered Geraldine's calls for more than a week. It was not unusual for him to be MIA for short periods of time, but this was enough to make her nervous. When Geraldine entered the Las Vegas home they shared, there was immediately a bad smell. Geraldine thought it was food that had been left burning on the stove. Sonny was known to do that. But when she went into their bedroom, she was greeted with a horrible sight. Sonny was lying slumped onto the bed, bloated. He hadn't been answering Geraldine's calls because he was dead. Coming up, we'll look at what may have happened to Sonny Liston and who was responsible. And now, back to the story. Sonny Liston had been born circa 1932 to a poor family, becoming a heavyweight boxing champion before easing into a Las Vegas life of crime. Now, in the early days of January 1971, instead of partaking in any of the plans that he'd made for himself over the holidays, he was dead. And an investigation was underway to figure out how and why. From the start, the efforts at investigating Sonny's death were bungled. For one thing, several hours passed between Geraldine's discovery of the body and her call to report the death to the police. By some reports, Geraldine called Sonny's lawyer and doctor immediately. We can't confirm whether or not this was the case, but there's no question that she waited a considerable length of time to call the police. We don't know what Geraldine was doing in that time, but given her history as a loyal and devoted wife, it seems safe to assume that she was cleaning up anything she would have deemed unsavory, like drugs or evidence of criminal activity. If Sonny's lawyer and doctor were there as well, we can only imagine that they were aiding in those efforts. When Geraldine did finally call the police two to three hours after finding his body, the news spread quickly through Sonny's Las Vegas community that Sonny Liston was dead. When Ash Resnick and Clyde Watkins heard about their friend's death, they immediately hopped into Ash's car and drove over to Sonny's house, blowing red lights to get there as fast as they could. Friends of the deceased probably should not have been wandering around an active crime scene, but they made themselves at home as the police went through the preliminary steps of conducting an investigation. So we can say with confidence that it was a potentially contaminated crime scene that police were investigating several hours after Geraldine had found Sonny's body. This place is pretty tidy, Sarge. Did a whole sweep of the up and downstairs. It's clean. What about the balloon of heroin? What balloon of heroin? On the kitchen table. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a... Oh. How did that get there? I I could have sworn it wasn't there when I checked this room ten minutes ago. You sure of that? Well, now I don't know. That's what I thought. Case might be closed because of this balloon. Given the way the police in Vegas operated in the late 60s and 70s, it's more than likely that the heroin found in Sonny Liston's kitchen was planted. For one thing, it doesn't quite track that Geraldine would have scrubbed the rest of the house clean but left a large amount of heroin on the dining room table for police to find. If she was concerned about her husband's image, there's no way she would have made that oversight. And two, finding drugs, planted or not, meant that police could get a warrant to search for the lion's share of Sonny's drugs, something they had been hoping to get their hands on for a while. Planting evidence to achieve a desired result was the general protocol for Vegas police in the 70s. No one would have batted an eye. Their initial conclusion for the cause of Sonny's death was that it was either a drug overdose or suicide. But they hadn't released an official cause yet when he was laid to rest on January 9th, 1971. Thousands of people came out to catch a glimpse of the heavyweight boxer's funeral procession. The church was packed with Vegas showgirls, promoters, bookies, and mobsters. Ella Fitzgerald, Doris Day, and Ed Sullivan all had front row seats. The Ink Spots even performed a special rendition of their song, Sunny. The turnout was an indication of how different the perception of Sunny had become since his start as a boxer. It was a far cry from the days in which Sunny endured racial slurs and was considered a monster. 
at the time of his death, he was a well-loved hero. Geraldine, stoic in her role of wife during Sonny's life, was weathered and frail at his funeral. She approached his casket, which lay open at the front of the room. <laughs> oh, oh, Sonny! There, there, Geraldine. Why don't we go sit down? Or get you some tea? No, I need to see him. I need to know. No, what, Geraldine? Sonny! What happened to you, Sonny? Can you tell me what happened to you? <laughs> oh, dear. Come on now, Geraldine. Geraldine had voiced a thought several had begun to express. Sonny's death was undeniably strange. It came out of nowhere. Suicide seemed unlikely as he was making plans for his future and noted by all around him to be in good spirits. The overdose theory seemed suspicious as well, as the only drugs that had been found in the house after his death might well have been planted. There seemed to be a very real possibility that Sonny's death occurred via unnatural circumstances. But on January 19, 1971, the coroner published his report. It is my conclusion from my findings that Sonny Liston died of natural causes. A poor supply of oxygen to the heart led to congestive heart failure, something perfectly reasonable for a man of his age. I also found traces of morphine and codeine in his system, but not enough to have killed a man of his size. Thus, they have no importance in determining the cause of his death. Police quickly wrapped up their investigation, concluding that there was no foul play involved in Sonny's death. They issued a statement saying as much, and that because he was a known heroin addict, his death was likely the unfortunate result of an overdose. But many of Sonny's friends had a problem with this. They claimed vehemently that Sonny was afraid of needles, and this claim was substantiated not only by one or two people, but by a whole slew of the late boxer's acquaintances. It was confirmed by his dentist, who had trouble doing dental work on Sonny because the boxer was too squeamish for administering anesthesia. It was confirmed by Sonny's friend, Davy Pearl. The same Davy Pearl he'd had breakfast with shortly before his death, who knew him intimately. It was also confirmed by Father Edward Patrick Murphy, who had known Sonny for a good portion of his life and had performed his funeral service. But it was most tangibly confirmed by Sonny's former trainer, Willie Reddish, who said that Sonny had actually canceled a planned tour of Africa to avoid getting the necessary vaccinations. If Sonny was afraid of needles, heroin would have been a tough drug of choice for him. There are other ways of taking heroin, but in order for a dose to become lethal, it would generally have to be taken intravenously. Sonny's friends were not convinced that Sonny died of a heroin overdose, and they certainly did not buy that his death was from natural causes. And they had good cause to think so. If Sonny wasn't injecting heroin into his veins, that rules out the possibility that his death was an overdose. Which meant that someone in Las Vegas knew something they weren't sharing. Something that suggested that Sonny Liston's death was really a murder. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. The bout for the heavyweight championship title. The rematch of the century. Reigning champion, Muhammad Ali. Versus the challenger and former heavyweight champ, Sonny Liston. And the fight has begun. The two champions are circling each other keeping their distance, sizing up their opponent. Ali is stepping forward, testing the waters. Ali throws the first punch. Looks like he missed. Liston has dropped to the floor. I've never seen anything like this. One punch and Liston is down. Looks like they're calling it. The match is over. Ali wins via knockout.
This is our second episode on Sonny Liston, the notorious heavyweight boxer who died mysteriously in his Las Vegas home in the last days of 1970. Last week, we examined the events leading up to his suspicious death. And this week, we'll uncover who may have been responsible. Sonny Liston was a black man born into poverty in the 1930s. Not only did he suffer abuse at the hands of his father, but he faced a mistrusting and often blatantly bigoted world. But through sheer talent and some ties to the mob, he was able to become a world heavyweight champion and celebrity. Sonny's boxing career was illustrious and celebrated. That is, until a supposedly fixed match against Muhammad Ali brought both him and his career down to the mat on May 25, 1965. His fans were puzzled and outraged. Why would a former world champion go down so easily? What did he have to gain from losing that match? The world would never know the answer to that question, although a fairly credible rumor suggested that the Nation of Islam, which backed Ali, had come to an agreement with the Mafia, which backed Sonny. If Sonny took a dive, the story goes, he'd be granted a cut of Ali's future profits. Based on the lavish life Sonny led until his death, the public had good reason to believe these rumors were true. Sonny became a fixture in Las Vegas, enjoying the lifestyle of a celebrity on the Vegas Strip. He developed a gambling habit, and to supplement his income, in 1966, the former heavyweight champ turned to selling drugs, with the help of his seedy friend, Ash Resnick. It's also possible that Sonny Liston used the drugs he sold. However, whether or not Sonny actually had a drug habit is debated to this day. Regardless, the unfortunate truth remains the same. On January 5th, 1971, an approximately 40-year-old Sonny Liston was found dead in his Las Vegas home with traces of heroin in his system. The coroner reported that his death was due to natural causes, lung congestion and heart failure, but this report would only lead to greater controversy. In fact, the police claimed that Sonny had a long history of using drugs, and they quickly wrote off his death as related to his presumed heroin use. This declaration struck those who knew Sonny as suspicious. They didn't believe Sonny would ever use heroin. He was deathly afraid of needles. Sonny, I need you to open up. I have to give you the anesthesia before we can start the procedure. Doctor, I can't. You keep that needle out of my mouth and you find another way. There is no other way. Unless I fill your cavity without anesthesia, and I guarantee you'll like that even less than the needle. You might be right. So what should we do? Oh, come on now, Sonny. Get back in the chair. I need to fill your cavity. (sighs) Linda, see if you can get him back in here. Sonny hated needles so much, according to his trainer, he even canceled a lucrative tour in Africa because he would have been required to get several vaccinations beforehand. So it seems safe to assume that if Sonny were using heroin, he did not do so intravenously. There are other ways for people to use heroin, but police found a puncture mark on Sonny's arm. Though ultimately, the coroner's report stated that the body was too decomposed to conclude whether that was related to cause of death. Given his extreme fear of needles, it seems incredibly unlikely that he had used a needle himself. Which makes it much more likely that somebody forced the heroin into his system. This is a particularly compelling idea because during the 1970s, one of the Mafia's favorite execution tactics was the lethal injection of heroin. Sonny had many connections to the mob, and while this afforded him a lot of luxuries in life, it also came with a high level of risk. Unfortunately for Sonny, by 1970, he wasn't as useful to the mob as he once had been and it is quite possible that they may have begun to think he was more trouble than he was worth. For one, there are reports that Sonny had gotten a little loose with sharing details of what really happened with the infamous Ali fight, particularly when he was drunk. Allegedly, he was often found in bars around Las Vegas airing his grievances. He claimed he was supposed to be paid some of Muhammad Ali's profits, but had yet to be paid at all. If this was true, and the Ali arrangement did take place, 
then the mob would certainly have a problem with Sonny talking about it around town. This was reason enough for them to take care of him. But Sonny made things worse for himself still. He got between the mob and their money. As he aged, Sonny's boxing matches became more infrequent. But in 1970, he had one fight scheduled against Chuck Wepner, the boxer who inspired Sylvester Stallone's character in Rocky. Unfortunately, Sonny's mafia-connected managers had other plans. They had a scheme to turn a profit even bigger than Sonny's fight would earn them. Listen, Sonny, got an update for you from up the ladder. We need you to throw the Chuck Wepner fight. No. No? No. After Ali, I was a joke. I want to win. That's how you're going to talk to me? I'm not loving this conversation, Liston. If he did refuse to throw the match for the mob, Sonny was essentially biting the hand that fed him. But he was also making it clear that he was no longer a useful player. This, combined with his loose tongue about the Ali fight, very well may have cost him his life. But the Mafia wouldn't have been the only group who had a problem with Sonny spreading that secret around town. The other party allegedly involved in the deal was a faction of the Nation of Islam. It's entirely possible they had a hand in Sonny's death as well. The Mafia and the Nation of Islam were two dangerous and intimidating organizations. But to make matters worse, they weren't the only ones who wanted Sonny dead. A former friend of Sonny's had also made no bones about wanting the boxer out of the picture. His name was Earl Cage, and he was a Las Vegas beautician. Earl! Sonny Liston, my man! You here for a haircut or to talk business? Haircut? But you know I always talk business. That's just a given. Got it. Hey, Angelina, go take your coffee break. Give Mr. Liston and I a little privacy to... Do a haircut. Yo, I got 25K worth of the good stuff in the back. Let's get to it. In addition to running a salon, Earl Cage was a successful drug dealer. He ran a mid-level cocaine and heroin operation in and around Las Vegas. Both Sonny and Earl participated in the illegal activities of the business, but ultimately, only one of them would pay the price. Police! This is a drug bust. Put your hands where I can see them. Earl Cage, you're under arrest. Sonny Liston. Hey, man, I'm not going to prison. You didn't let me finish. I was going to say, how are you? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I'll, I was just here getting a haircut. I'm not involved in anything suspicious or whatever you're here for. You're free to go. Enjoy your night. Boys, get Earl in the car, would you? When police raided Earl's ranch home in North Las Vegas, they let Sonny walk free. That same night, as Earl was booked into the station, Sonny was pulled over for drunk driving. He was so irate that he punched the cop and ended up spending the night in jail anyway. However, the case never officially went to court. Reportedly, Earl was angry about this injustice and especially about the fact that Sonny didn't use his influence to get both of them off the hook. So Earl vowed to get revenge on Sonny. When I get out of this place, I'll get that son of a- Hey, settle down. Don't make me get the warden. I'm not doing anything. I'm just saying, Sonny Liston's gonna pay. After Sonny's death, many in Vegas thought that Earl saw to it that Sonny did pay. But for the Las Vegas Police Department in 1971, all of these potential suspects, the mob, the Nation of Islam, and Earl Cage, were entirely irrelevant. They had closed the file on Sonny Liston, and they weren't interested in reopening it. Though very few people actually believed Sonny's death to be natural or an accident, its classification went unchallenged for over a decade. Then, in 1982... One surprise visitor at the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department changed everything. Coming up, we'll look at the shocking details that emerged regarding Sonny's death and see what they may mean for the case. And now, back to the story. 
After Sonny Liston's mysterious death in December of 1970, there were a handful of people pleased to see the divisive boxer gone. But there were exponentially more still who couldn't accept that he had died from natural causes. He had won 15 of his last 16 fights, 14 by knockout. Sure, he had a drinking problem, but he seemed fit as a fiddle. Despite the general public's suspicions, there was nothing they could do. The case was closed. That is, until June 14, 1982, when a visitor to the LVMPD broke the case wide open. The mysterious visitor was received by one officer, Gary Beckwith. A little over a decade prior, he had been one of the police officers who had investigated Sonny's death. In fact, he was one of the first to arrive at the scene the night Geraldine discovered the body. Hello, Beckwith here. Gary, I got a guy here you need to talk to. Can it wait? I don't think so. He says he's got information on something about to go down. There might even be something in this that's new on Sonny Liston. The man Beckwith spoke to that day was named Irwin Peters, and the tale he proceeded to tell the officer was a strange one. Peters had been working as a professional crook in Vegas alongside a former undercover cop named Larry Gandy. Gandy was a Vietnam vet with significant PTSD. He later claimed that this condition drove him to volunteer for the most volatile, dangerous drug busts he could participate in. Gandy would frequently arrest drug dealers by posing as a customer. Most dealers at the time wouldn't sell unless you used their product in front of them, so Gandy had to get clever. He kept capsules of maple syrup in his pocket, which he would switch out with heroin pills at the last minute to inject into his veins. Afterwards, he'd have the dealer arrested. Gandy was an extremely effective undercover cop, but his non-traditional methods clashed with the modernization of the department. He was eventually fired from the force for insubordination. Though he sued and won his job back, he chose to walk away regardless. Then, ejected from law enforcement and with nothing to lose, Gandy turned to bounty hunting and then crime, including partnering with Irwin Peters to run a successful robbery operation in the late 60s and 70s. The two men developed a unique system for their burglaries. Gandy acquired a real estate license so he could case a home by posing as a realtor, setting up an open house. Then, on a different day, at an agreed-upon time, Erwin Peters would go to the house, tie up and blindfold the unsuspecting owners, and call Gandy. Gandy would then show up and rob the place, taking everything valuable that he could get his hands on. As Erwin Peters recounted the robberies he'd done with Gandy, Beckwith listened with rapt attention. One particularly odd detail stuck out to him. Peters told him that, while performing the robberies, Gandy disguised his voice as Daffy Duck. And remember that Sonny Liston thing? Gandy killed him. He shot Sonny up with heroin. That's where you lose me, Pete. There was no murder. That wasn't an overdose. Gandy bragged to me right after he did it. Beckwith didn't know how much he could trust what Erwin Peters had told him. As far as he knew, Sonny's death was investigated and done with. Death by natural causes, probably due to his heavy drug use. Sonny was a heroin addict, and that was that. Plus, despite Larry Gandy's record, he was well-respected in the force. Something of a legend, even. It was tough for Beckwith to believe that he had been behind a significant portion of Las Vegas's robberies. Still, just to be sure, Beckwith began looking into the claims Peters made. He searched through records of robberies done in the Las Vegas area over the past decade, and to his surprise, he found a connection. Many of the victims described that the robber underneath the mask spoke in a distinct Daffy Duck voice. There it was. At least one part of Peters' claims seemed to be true. Beckwith's next step was to see if the robbery Peters predicted would actually take place. The officer had serious doubts that the infamous Larry Gandy would be making an appearance, but the Daffy Duck coincidence was too strange to ignore. So, on June 16, 1982, Beckwith set up a sting. That same day, 
Erwin Peters began to carry out a robbery with Gandhi, just as they always had. First, Peters went into the house. Inside, instead of a couple of unsuspecting homeowners to tie up, there were only cops milling about. His tip had worked. After about 20 minutes, Peters called Gandhi, his voice shaking. He was terrified. Hey, uh, Gandhi, I... I got everything taken care of over here. Cool. I'll be there in a sec. My ass is killing me. My car seat is all messed up. Say, you want to get some food after this? I'm starving. Sure. What do you want to eat? I don't don't know. Anything. Anything? You don't have an opinion? Mexican? Italian? We could go get waffles at Merriam's. Any of those sound great. Any of those? Who is this and what did you do with Peters? You're in a weird mood today, man. Never known you not to have an opinion on waffles. Just get over here, okay? Jeez, I'm on my way. Testy. But when Gandhi walked through the door, it wasn't a routine robbery waiting for him on the other side. Instead, he faced a row of police guns all pointed at him. Gandhi put his hands up, revealing that he was unarmed. All of the policemen sighed heavily with relief. None of them wanted to have to shoot the legendary Larry Gandy. Gandy was arrested without a fight and read his rights. A second piece of Irwin Peters' intel had proved to be true. This left Beckwith seriously wondering. Maybe Larry Gandy had killed Sonny Liston. But Beckwith thought they had enough on Gandy to put him away for ten years at least with the robbery charges. It didn't matter which crime Gandy went away for, as long as he was put away. But Beckwith underestimated Gandhi's connections, who walked away with an indefinitely suspended sentence. It's hard to know for certain if Beckwith actually thought Gandhi killed Sonny. Ultimately, nothing could really be done with this potential lead. In 1982, the Las Vegas Police Department had no substantial evidence that Larry Gandhi had murdered Sonny. And the years after that didn't change. So, Sonny's death remained listed as due to natural causes in the police files. More than a decade after his body was discovered, the case went back to laying dormant. That is, until nearly 20 years later, when an ESPN magazine journalist named Sean Assale tracked down Larry Gandy. The answers he found would shock him. Coming up, we'll hear what Larry Gandy himself had to say about the death of Sonny Liston. And now, back to the story. After Sonny Liston was discovered dead in his Las Vegas home on January 5th, 1971, the cops ruled that he died of natural causes, stemming from lung congestion. But many weren't convinced that his death had been natural. Despite several possible suspects with clear motives, the Las Vegas Police Department had made no effort to investigate Sonny's death any further. Determined to find an answer where the LVMPD had not, Sean Assale, an ESPN magazine investigative journalist and author, began his own research. Sonny Liston's death was something of a legend at ESPN, and Assale had heard quite a bit about the boxer over the years. His interest in Sonny was piqued when he began researching unsolved murders for a novel. After coming across the details of Sonny's case, a sale began to pursue answers to the famous boxer's death in earnest. And eventually, he wrote an entire book on the subject. While conducting his research, a sale traced Officer Gary Beckwith's story to its conclusion, where it stopped just short of providing any real answers. But a sale wanted more. His first instinct was to reach out to Erwin Peters, but unfortunately, he never got the chance to speak to the informant. A sale learned that Peters had ratted on Gandhi because Gandhi hadn't paid him his full share of their earnings from their robberies. But while Peters was able to put Gandhi away, it didn't yield the outcome he was hoping for. Not only did Gandhi still refuse to pay Peters, he was furious. He made it clear that he would kill Peters as soon as he got the chance. Scared that Gandhi would make good on that promise, Erwin Peters left Las Vegas in 1986 and moved to rural Oregon. There, he got married and started a new life far from his checkered past. 
Peters was always evasive about his whereabouts, even with his close family. His parents never knew where he was, and he instructed them not to ask him on the phone, as he was certain that his lines were tapped. But even with all his precautions, someone still found him. Babe, you got a postcard. A postcard? That's odd. No one knows this address. No one should even know I'm in Oregon. It's postmarked from Las Vegas. Let me see it. It's just a picture of a barren desert. Well, what's on the back? It says, this is where you'll be. Oh, God. Oh, don't be upset, babe. Maybe it's just something from the Tourism Bureau. Like, this is where you'll be next year on vacation. Or maybe it's just a teenager doing a prank. Put it in the trash and don't sweat it. But there was good reason for Peters to sweat it. One morning, just months after he and his new wife were married, she woke up to an empty bed. She couldn't find her new husband anywhere. She heard the car running in the garage and went to investigate. To her horror, she found Erwin Peters in the driver's seat, dead by apparent suicide. The theory that her husband had killed himself never made sense to Peters' wife or with anyone else who knew Peters, especially since Erwin Peters had lived in fear of Larry Gandy. When a sale learned of Peters' death, he was discouraged, but still determined to get to the bottom of things. A sale considered his next move. If he wanted answers, he'd have to track down the man himself. He began looking for Larry Gandy. In the 21st century, finding Gandy was surprisingly easy. After a simple search on Facebook, a sale miraculously found the legendary ex-cop and sent him a message. He wasn't sure what he was expecting, but the response he got was far more open and honest than anything he could have hoped for. After exchanging a few messages back and forth, Gandhi wrote, I would be delighted to sit down with you. I was well known in the old days. Some of my activities were positive, and some were... Shameful. However, I have come to terms with my life and realized that I was responsible for my actions. I can't justify any of my behavior and can only give you the facts. I know the difference between right and wrong. It should be noted that I have finally forgiven myself and have quit carrying that bag of rocks up the mountain looking for a penance. See you. As the two made plans to meet at Gandhi's home, a sale wondered what actions Gandhi was referring to. And given Gandhi's history, he couldn't help but feel a bit scared. As he knocked on the ex-cop's door, his heart pounded in his chest. Sean, nice to meet you. Uh, likewise. How's it going? Let me guess. You're here to ask if I killed Sonny Liston. Well, I can't say you're wrong. <laughs> Come on in. So you didn't do all those robberies together? Seeing Gandhi cut to the chase, a sale soon asked Gandhi about the claims Peters had made against him. After all, many of them were quite serious. Yeah, all that stuff Peter said about me? I don't know what happened to him. He started to believe a lot of stuff that wasn't true. So you didn't do all those robberies together? Oh, we did some of the robberies. But when I was a cop, I was a cop. I was always clean. The robberies were later, when I couldn't be on the force anymore. They took away my identity, you know? And I needed something. You can ask me what you came here to ask, if I killed Sonny. Okay. Well, did you? Nah, I didn't. But I could tell you who did. Really? Who? Earl Cage. Man owned a beauty salon and sold a heck of a lot of heroin out of that shop with Sonny. He killed him. You can count on it. A sale published this accusation in his book, The Murder of Sonny Liston, Las Vegas, Heroin, and Heavyweights in 2016. And there's good reason to believe it could be true. Earl Cage was the beautician and drug dealer who ran the mid-level heroin operation with Sonny back in the 60s. But when a drug bust landed Earl in jail, Sonny had walked out scot-free. Earl had always been angry at Sonny and vowed to get revenge. 
And so it's not hard to believe that there was some truth to what Gandhi told Asael. Still, even with a story as compelling as Gandhi's, there were many contradictions and convoluted accounts surrounding Sonny's death. Some say he died of a drug overdose, while others say he didn't use drugs at all. Some pointed the finger at Ash Resnick and Larry Gandy, and Gandy pointed it at Earl. But the murder could just as easily have been the work of the mob or the Nation of Islam. And despite how many of Sonny's acquaintances wished him harm, the suspects we've explored thus far still aren't the only answers to the question, who killed Sonny Liston? A chapter in a recent book has offered yet another possible murder suspect. The book, written by Greg Swaim and published in 2015, is called Warjack, America's Most Wanted. It profiles the author's father, the late mobster Dale Klein, a.k.a. James John Warjack. Warjack was an infamous hitman for the mob, as well as Swaim's absentee father, Finally, at the age of 30, the two met, and Swaim urged Warjack to open up about his past. Warjack was hesitant. He had once been on the FBI's most wanted list and feared that any talk of his sordid history would only incriminate his family. Finally, one night, with the help of alcohol, Swaim got some shocking information from his father about his past. God, I love whiskey. Mm. All right, what were you asking me? You're relentless, fine. Here's a story. You know the boxer Sonny Liston? Of course, he was a heavyweight champion. Yeah? Well, I killed him. What? You killed him? All right, just keep your voice down. Don't get all riled up. It was all pretty routine. Mob needed him to go, so I gave him an overdose of heroin. But you keep that to yourself. Got it. I'm serious! Or you won't like what happens. There's a movie script out there that'll explain all of it. But that's for after I'm dead. Swaim promised he wouldn't go digging and kept his father's secret for many years. But in 1997, Warjack passed away and Swaim flew to Los Angeles to retrieve and sort his father's belongings. That's when he made an interesting discovery. Amongst his father's things, Swaim found a business card for a movie producer. He called the number on the card and found that the man knew his father well and was also connected with the mob. Soon, Swaim arranged a meeting. And my dad said there's a script that would explain everything. Do you know anything about that? There is a script, and it contains a heck of a lot. But listen... Just leave it alone. I won't do anything with it, but could I at least just read it? Someday. But for right now, it'll do things to your family that you don't want. Best to just let sleeping dogs lie. We don't know what's in that movie script and probably won't find out for many years. But we do know that Dale Klein, a.k.a. James John Warjack, claims that he was the hitman who offed Sonny Liston for the mob. It's certainly a plausible answer. After all, Warjack is the only person to have actually claimed to have killed Sonny, rather than simply being accused of it. And as for Sonny's wife and son, neither ever spoke publicly about their husband and father's death. After Sonny died, Geraldine retreated from the limelight, working various service jobs in the Las Vegas casinos. Geraldine didn't want to be the subject of attention. While at work, she always wore a name tag that simply said Jerry with a J instead of a G. It was a thin facade, but it did the trick. On one of the rare occasions that she granted the press an interview, Geraldine avoided speaking about her husband's death almost entirely, during his life, she'd been protective of Sonny, and she remained loyal to his legacy for years after his death. Though his life was embroiled in hardship and racism from the very beginning, Sonny rose to the highest possible level a fighter could achieve. But with the reckless air that compels someone to make a career out of fighting, Sonny was sure to have his enemies. And because of this, and perhaps because of the unchecked racism common in the 1970s, his death was never investigated further. 
To this day, the cause is still listed as due to natural causes. It's a tragedy that his death was never formally looked into as a murder, and that his killer, whoever it was, was never brought to justice. We may never know for certain who killed Sonny Liston, if anybody killed him at all, but with as many potential suspects as the case had, any of them could have brought him to his untimely end. Well, looking over the facts, I think that John James Warjak killed Sonny for the mob. Uh, we know that they had multiple reasons to want Sonny dead, and simply offing him would certainly be the way they'd deal with the problem. Plus, Warjak actually confessed. Huh, interesting. See, I think it was Larry Gandy. It seems odd for Irwin Peters to put himself at such risk by accusing Gandy of the crime if it wasn't true. I guess we'll never know. Well, at least until that movie script comes out. <laughs> 